Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have Herbie Levine give us this finale of this very special first anniversary edition. Uh, Herbie, please tell us about living many, many histories. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to tell you about transitioning from non-biological systems to biological systems. I'm going to skip my personal history uh, and start out with where I was and where many of us in the sort of uh, non-equilibrium condensed matter physics community was uh, sort of in the mid 80s, uh, we were all studying pattern formation of various kinds. And those patterns ranged from sort of snowflakes to viscous fingering, which uh, caused the models such as the diffusion limit aggregation models, very popular. And we all felt that we were making tremendous progress uh, in sort of the mid 80s, and uh, this is one paper from those days with my, uh, at that time, longtime collaborator, Eshel Ben Jacob, who I'll mention in a moment again. And um, uh, during that period of time, uh, there was a, whoops, where is my, why is it? Come on. Why are we not going to the next screen? There um, we go. There so, okay, yeah, there we go. So during that period of time, there was a Gordon conference in 1986, which was sort of a coming together of all the people thinking about pattern formation. And it was an opportunity for many of us to get together and try to understand to what extent what we were learning about non-living systems might be applicable to living systems. And the person who I did most of my thinking about that with was Eshel Ben Jacob. In fact, I was living in Connecticut at the time, working for an industrial research lab. And it took about two hours to drive back from the Gordon conference in New Hampshire to my home in Connecticut, and Eshel came with me, and we had a two hour long discussion of exactly how long uh, it would take before we could begin applying our ideas to living systems. Eshel later on sort of immortalized that trip with this road from azoic systems to the living world with lots of detours when he used to give talks about his work on bacterial colonies. So, Okay, it's interesting. So it about circa 19, so I kept thinking about the right biological systems to study, but uh, unwilling to do what uh, was just described and just do nothing uh, publishable for a few years. We continued our work on physical and chemical systems. By 1990, our group had moved to UC San Diego and we were studying nonlinear chemical waves. Uh, this is a, a, a simulation movie of a very famous chemical reaction called Bezel-Belozov-Shabatinsky reaction. Uh, I didn't want to talk too much about my personal background, but I should say that uh, one of the motivations for going into science for me was that when I was a elementary school student, I went to a demonstration of uh, sponsored by the DuPont company on nonlinear effects in chemical systems. And they showed uh, color changing uh, Belozov-Shabatinsky reactions where the, the person up there had a stopwatch, could count down and say when the reaction would change the solution from blue to red. And I was so impressed that a theory could do that, that I resolved to become a theoretical physicist at that point, uh, sort of. So anyway, so we were working on the Belozov-Shabatinsky reaction, but still on the lookout for the right biological system to study. Now, in those days, you know, this is uh, 1990, you know, you didn't have all papers in the universe at your uh, computer terminal. If you wanted to go read the current issue of some journals or just sort of you know, browse other things going on, you would actually physically walk to a building called the library. So this is a picture of the Geisel Library named after the Dr. Seuss author uh, in UC San Diego. It's a really nice building and it's a really nice place to walk to. So I used to go there on occasion and just sit there leafing through the stacks of papers and came across this paper uh, in, uh, that was published in 1989 on a biological system called slime molds, or more technically uh, dictostelium. It was by a number of people who I discovered afterwards were quite well-known mathematical biologists. And what they pointed out is that those types of nonlinear waves that I had been studying and, and trying to understand in these chemical systems actually had a very large application to the life cycle of dictostelium. So the way the life cycle of dictostelium works is they start out as individual cells, uh, but when they starve, they aggregate together and then go through this amazing series of morphological transformations. And the aggregation pattern happens sort of according to the way you'll see in the movie below. Uh, on the left, you see just the cell density. On the right, you see a processed image. And what you begin to see is as the hours go by after starvation, you begin to see these nonlinear waves propagating through the colony. That's what you see on the right. These nonlinear waves guide the cells, and as time goes on, it creates the 
process whereby the cells communicate with each other and aggregate. And so in starting on the left, you'll begin to see the cells moving together and clumping. Eventually, one large spiral wave will take over the geometry and you'll start getting a very large clump of cells to the right over there. So this was exactly the, the bridge that we, we felt we needed to go from what we had been studying in sort of the physical chemical world to a biological system because these were waves that at least to this paper that we read looked very analogous to what we knew how to think about. So we started working on this and uh, I recruited a adventurous graduate student, adventurous because I told him, well, you know, who knows if we're going to make any progress on this, who knows if we'll ever get any papers published, but it's fun, so let's try. So we started working on this aggregation and we, after about a year and a half worth of work, while we were doing other things, we published a paper in that famous biology journal called PRL. And uh, I should mention a quote from around that era that I happened to be at UCLA talking to some cardiology people and, uh, and, and the discussion of what journals it paid to publish some of these biological physics papers in. And his direct quote was publishing a paper about biology and fissure of letters is an admission of irrelevance. And I think it's good that that, that type of thinking is now way in the past. Now, I think many important papers about biology are indeed published in Fizrev letters, nature physics, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, so we began to do this work. And then, you know, we had this, you know, a bit, a episode of luck that you take advantage of. So in, the, in Andrea's talk, he mentioned that luck can play an important role. And, and luck still clearly played an important role here. But once you get a lucky break, then you must take advantage of it. So the lucky break was the following. So my student, who was a more serious than I was about the biology part of this project, came to my office one day and said, you know, we're working on this organism, Dictostelium, and we really don't know much about the biology. So I went to the library, again, physically, walked to the library, took out a book, and said, I wanted to learn a little more about Dictostelium, and I found something totally amazing. And he showed me this book. And I said, oh, it looks great. It looks, you know, it'll be interesting to read it and see what they know about this. And he said, but you haven't discovered the most amazing part. The most, and I said, what's that? He says, well, open to the next page. So this was the next page of the book written by William Loomis, who turned out to be in the biology department at UC San Diego. So we quickly ran to Bill Loomis's office. There is a picture of Bill Loomis. And uh, just to give you an idea of the geometry in the bottom right, you see a picture looking west on the left side of that picture is a building called Mayer Hall, named after Maria Goppert Mayer, the Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist, which is the UCSD physics department. On the right-hand side of that uh, bridge thing is the UCSD biology department in a building called Bonner Hall. There's that bridge that allows you to walk from one to the other without even touching the ground. My office was on the left, Bill Loomis's office was on the right. It was exactly a three minute walk from my offices to his, and we had never heard of him, but he turned out to be the world's expert on this organism that we had somehow, by luck, just managed to work on. So we created a long series of collaborations, a long series of efforts over a long, over about a 20 year period, just to show you one example of work from that long period of effort. This is now looking at the single cell behavior of dictostelium, showing in red, uh, actin protruding, showing in green contractions due to myosin, and watching the way in which individual cells moved. And this is a microfluidics device, which is now used in, in, in great detail in cell biology experiments, showing exactly how the cell manages to follow those gradients that are generated by those waves dynamically is part of this aggregation uh, lifestyle uh, of dictostelium. So, you know, so that's really all I had to say. Uh, it was uh, a, a sort of conscious effort to change from non-living systems to living systems, but we waited for a long time to figure out exactly how best to do that. And the way to best to do that was to start working on something and then take advantage of lucky breaks. And uh, you know, we've never looked back since since around that period of time. And I never regretted the idea of of uh, beginning more more deeply into understanding the biological aspects of these uh, fascinating problems. With that, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Herbie. Um, I I'm throwing the floor open for questions. Anybody with questions, please feel free to unmute and go for it. Jay, go for it. Yeah, I have a question. Actually, probably towards all the three speakers, you all transition from a non-living system to living system. What do you see being the biggest difference? 
do living systems go against physics law, the entropy law? Um, I think the biggest difference is just the degree of complexity. I, I think, uh, Andreas, you, you start out thinking that this looks just like a living version of a non-living problem. And I think we all start out that way because we have to in order to get started. Uh, but you quickly discover, especially, you know, I discovered it by just repeated very long discussions with my biology collaborator that we met. You eventually discover that the biological system is much deeper. It does much more things. It has to uh, coordinate many more dynamical processes. It's not just waves and motion. It's got to coordinate its gene expression. It's got to collaborate. It's got to coordinate its metabolism. It's got to do all these things sort of at the same time in ways that are just beyond the complexity of any of the physical systems we have been trained to think about. So, so, so being willing to deal with that and trying to then not just give up and not just run screaming back to physics, which, you know, sometimes, <laughs> uh, sometimes we want to do that, but, you know, not so at least, you know, not giving into the urge to do that uh, it requires really trying to understand better why all those biological complexities are needed, how to try to make sense of what's going on, even in the presence of those complexities. And uh, that's the, really the challenge, at least for me, uh, is how to do that. Um, I'm going to let Andrea, if he wants, jump in after we close the recording. But since we're still recording, I'll quickly take the second question uh, from Thorsten, and then we can wrap. Yeah, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I actually think that this um, thing, that this time when you kind of can publish a biology paper in DRL is not really um, seen by many biologists that this would be like a relevant paper. Um, so I wonder, I mean, how you manage to convince or how much do you feel like a biologist now? So you really, you said that, you, that you're more like in a biology part. I, I don't you know, feel like a biologist at all, uh, uh, but but I think I, I spent many years trying to convince biologists, you know, singly and, and, and you know, and, and sometimes in, in, in larger groups that the physics perspective, the physics conceptual framework can help them. And I think helping them means understanding what they want to be helped with. It doesn't mean going to them and say, you know, I care about this and I need you to do that experiment for me. That doesn't work. But if you can figure out what aspects of the systems they really think are essential and they care about, and you can bring some conceptual understanding that helps them, that predicts what are the best new experiments to do, and especially if that one turns out to be right and exciting, then I think you know they're happy with 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 physicists working on this. I, I really not felt uh, on the large part. Of course, there are always uh, uh, individual exceptions, but on the large part, and I think with increasing uh, frequency. Uh, you know, it's, it's okay to, to think about the physics aspects of these problems. It's okay to uh, do things that maybe the physics community is more interested in the biology community and you publish it in PRL instead of in PNAS or whatever. Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, there is a general trend towards understanding that these are useful ways of complementing what the biologists are doing. So I don't feel like a biologist at all, but I think I am contributing at least to some things in that field. On that note of building bridges, let's clap for all the speakers and I'm switching off the recording.